Welcome to the Physique Development Muscle Series. In this special series, we're breaking down the science and art of training each muscle group. Each episode is dedicated to a specific muscle, providing you with expert insight into its function, dispelling common training misconceptions, and highlighting our go-to exercises that deliver results. We'll also share key execution cues to help you perfect your technique and maximize your gains. Get ready to elevate your training game and achieve your fitness goals like never before. Let's dive into quads. Before we dive in, I need to welcome the next guest to the show, a very special guest who is also a previous client, Aaron Straker. Side note, he recently got engaged to his better half, Jenny Blake. In the comments, show them some love before you get into the episode. Aaron became a fitness coach after spending years in the software industry and realized his passion for helping others. Aaron is the founder of Straker Nutrition Company, and his goal is to improve lives through teaching sustainable principles and building better habits. He also co-hosts the Eat, Train, and Prosper podcast with Brian Borstein. Aaron believes that education is ultimately the missing key for those who struggle to achieve long-term success, and that is a huge reason why we started this exact series. So let's dive into learning more about quads. Aaron, there's multiple reasons why I wanted to have you on today's episode, but the first one is, is that when we were DMing back and forth, you had said the one muscle group that you have spent a ton of time trying to grow and struggled with was quads. And I want to kick things off with our conversation today of explaining to everyone or going back in time of what were you doing training your quads when you were having the hardest time seeing them grow? Like you were the most frustrated. What were you doing to try and grow your quads, whether it be the exercises that you were performing, the, um, the volume allocations, the frequency, what were the things that you were doing that just weren't working for you? Yeah. So I would say some of the, the, my biggest mistakes is I got really caught up and, and I guess around like the 2006, like the mid to late 2000s timeframe is really when I'm like coming of age, I'm in university in that kind of like that, like kind of old, old hard ass, you know, toxic masculinity, uh, vibe of like, all you need is a barbell back squat. The sis, the Smith machine is for sissies, like, and all this stuff. And I was still like impressionable enough to be like, okay, well, I don't want to do that. Like I just need to squat. And at that time, um, I was predominantly like into the CrossFit space and, and then, you know, within Olympic weightlifting and that sort of thing. So just doing a lot of squatting, like a lot, a lot of barbell squatting. And I got pretty strong and I I have very good, you know, ankle dorsiflexion in mobility. So I'm, I'm fortunate in that regard. I also have very long femurs. And, uh, it's, they just did not grow and, and it's, I've been so, so strong in, in the past and stuff, but my quads just like did not grow. I am just happened to be a very like adductor and hip dominant squatter. They, my, my hip hinge pattern is so much stronger than my squat pattern. So what would typically happen is my body would just shift into a position where I have more better leverages to move the load. So like my adductors would grow. My ass was huge. <laughs> I had these like torpedoes uh, for spinal erectors and very small quads. <laughs> for for reference, what would you say you were deadlifting at the time relative to, to squatting? <sighs> well, the, the thing was with it, at that time, we never did like deadlift cycles or anything like that. Um, but we did so much like volume deadlifting in terms of, you know, other stiff legs, RDLs, uh, all the, the, the power cleans, um, cleans, snatches of the, of the Olympic weightlifting. But I, I, whenever we would maybe mess around, you know, in, in deadlift, I mean, I could pull 405 for an easy 10 to 12 and work up to just either just shy of 500 or over 500. And that's with no, like near maximal loading ever. I might do that every four months. Wow, I would okay. still be able to be like very close to a top end performance. Um, whereas uh, I ran my most successful squat at that time was after a, a small off or as far as I could make it into small off before my body started to fall apart. And that was a 425 single high bar. Wow. Okay. For, for the listeners, can you give detail on the small off? Yeah. So, oh man, I mean, I'm talking about a decade ago doing this. Now 
please forgive me, it may be a Bulgarian program, it may be a Russian program, it, it's Eastern European, let's call it that, of of uh, 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 just a disastrously brutal high volume squat program. I believe it's four days per week. Uh, I believe the first day is like five sets of nine. And, and then uh, the midweek session is comes down to like uh, nine sets of five. And then you go into like a, a 10 sets of three on like Friday or something like that. And then there's like a fourth day. It, it's a lot. Yeah. And it was, I believe four days per week. And that's kind of like a, a volume accumulation part of it. And then you do like a, a kind of a mid cycle testing to, to reset your numbers for like the next phase. And the second phase is, is where things get like, not the volume isn't as intense, but the loads, it's like, all right, well now we're doing, you know, 80% or 85% for, you know, five sets of four or something like that. And, and that's, that's the part where I could just never make it through. Like my knees would be blown up or my lower back would be blown up and, uh, I think it's a, a it's a nine week program. Maybe my goodness. I'm really stretching my memory here. It's okay, and I would only be able to make it to like week six or something like that before bad things just started happening. I can imagine that that is a hellacious amount of volume. I've I've never ran it. I was fairly familiar with it. It's been a minute since I've heard someone speak on it. Um, but yeah, crazy crazy volume. Now, as you got to a place where you did start to see progress with your quads and started to actually see the growth that you were desiring, what were the things that you changed and, and how did you how did you go about that? Yeah. So after many failed attempts, I was finally able to remove like my ego and load from training. And, and that was really the biggest thing. It was for so long, like if I was not putting at least, you know, 315 on the bar, it was a day wasted in terms of a leg day sort of thing. And that really couldn't be further from the truth. It was really just after getting frustrated enough of like, I've done so much and they're still like, I mean, they were not like embarrassingly small because I obviously trained them and trained them heavy, but relative to the rest of the hypertrophy on my body, it was night and day, the, the, the progress there or the lack of progress. And, and really it was just opening my mind and moving away from the, the modalities that I had been, I don't want to call like pigeonholed by, but primarily focused in and, and getting more into like the hypertrophy space. Uh, and then using things like hack squat leg press, right? The hack squat and like the pendulum were, were very eye-opening and very uh, like uh, special, I guess I could say for me, because those two pieces of equipment remove my primary problem with a free bar back squat is that I shift into a position to make it more hip dominant because that's where my natural strength uh, strengths lie. When you're on a hack squat, when you're on a pendulum, you can't do that because you have the back support. So it, it was those things that just kind of removing my, uh, I guess, you know, predispositions from, from me being able to use them and being like, no, your quads have to do the work. The knees have to stay out over the toes because that's how the machine is designed. Uh, it was, wasn't until using those that I was like, okay, things are happening now. Like I could actually got, get these monster pumps in my quads and they would get really fatigued and sore. And it was, I was like, oh, these sensations that happen when I train these other muscle groups are now happening like in this muscle group. So it was really just like finding the right pieces of the puzzle after just kind of, you know, uh, foolishly avoiding them for so long. Right. And so with the, the previous programming, it was more, especially within CrossFit, you were having a lot of frequency to squatting or just knee flexion, uh, based movements in general when you started to see progress more, did you have less frequency, the same frequency? What was the differences there? It was less frequency. It was less frequency of squatting. And, and I should, should provide that even after the CrossFit, I, I had a, about a year and a half competing in Olympic weightlifting until that came to a halt after a knee surgery. And then I moved kind of into like a GPP. I was following like general strength programming, but still a lot more of like a strong lifts five by five style things where it would still be a lot of barbell movements, but was broadening my horizons slightly, but was still, um, again, ego tied to, to a barbell squat and that sort of thing. So, uh, that was the, the basis there. Do you remember the moment when it clicked for you, where you went from 
I'm training for brute force and trying to lift as heavy as possible. And then when it really clicked of, oh, I f- actually feel my quad lengthening. I feel a you know pump and contraction. Do you remember that moment? I do remember. There, there was a few in Sometimes it would be, I, I would start a little, I remember the first time I was on like a hack squat and, and I don't really remember why I like ventured over to that part of the gym. And I remember like hating it and it being so heavy and I could only have like one plate on each side and it was like brutally hard. And I know why, because I was just like very weak in that position, you know, and then it exposed me. And that was like the first kind of like a, I, it like burned me. I was like, I'm not using this thing. That That's awful. That feels, you know, super hard. I'm not using that. And ironically, it was probably about two years later after I'm trying to think. So by this time I had already started like nomading in, in you know, in, in my nutrition coaching business and stuff. But I remember I was in a, in a gym in, in Medellin, Colombia on the hack squat and we just joined the new gym. And I was like, okay, uh, you know, I'm commencing this leg program. I'm going to start using these things. And I was like, I'm doing sets of 15, you know, on the hack squat. And that's what I said I was going to do. And it was a very well designed hack squat and and it just it just lit my legs up and i like f- had that gnarly vmo pump and stuff for the first time and i was like something's happening you know like something is happening like i i can feel the, the difference and it was really just i i like finally getting letting go of like my, my ego and my biases and just like loading it appropriately taking it as full range of motion as I possibly could, like controlling my eccentrics and not just trying to lift the most, but instead trying to like drive a stimulus. And for some reason, like it finally made it through my like thick skull and it, and it all just clicked. And, and ever since that day, it's been like a, a whole new world of something that I thought like, maybe you just, you know, don't have the genetics for it. And, and of course, like, let's, let's say I genetically, like my quads are slower to respond than other things, but I felt like I, it was no longer a losing battle after that day. Right. But yeah, that's a, yeah, that's, a, it's awesome that you can recall that moment and be able to like go back to it and, and, you know, have that in your memory with your, the, the hack squat specifically, do you remember the brand of what hack it was? No. And, and, and honestly, I, it was probably some like locally fabricated oh, okay. one, no name sort of thing. Yeah. So let's, let's look at this from a lens of now coaching and you're working with a client. They have been in a place where they are struggling to grow their quads. How do you get them to a place where they have that same understanding that you came to? I I believe because I I know like how stubborn I, I guess I was with it. I can be a lot more like direct, you know, and I'm like, okay, send me a video, you know? And then when they send it, I'm like, no, you know, like here is what we want to do. Like, I want your feet here. Like, let's set the foot plate at this angle to, to allow us to achieve, you know, a, a greater, um, uh, uh, forward angle of, of the tibia. And so, and I, I can just be very, very specific and precise and be like, put this here, do that there, like lower. And then they'll send the next room like lower, <laughs> you know, and, and some clients like are, they get it pretty quickly. Other clients, I have to be like, okay, right. We're, I'm like, I want you to put no weight on it and you're going to go until it hits the bottom. Right. And I'm like, that is where each rep gets to. And like some people, maybe it's like fear or it's, it's foreign, you know, for a lot of people going below parallel like that, like they, it's like the danger zone, like things you're, you're, you're feeling a lengthening of your quad. You've never felt before. You're feeling it in the adductor. I mean, if you think about it, it is kind of, you know, scary and that you're getting literally like folded, you know, right. compressed all the way down. And it's, it's human nature to not, it doesn't feel pleasant by any stretch of the imagination, but like that's, that's where the, that's where the magic happens really. So it's, it's, it's being like direct enough and being like this. Yeah. That's what it is. Now we progress from there each, each day, each week, we add additional reps, we add some load and it, it's just like big climb to the top from here. But like that is where the magic happens. I couldn't agree more. So what's the, what's the most common mistakes when they send those videos to you? Uh, what exercises are you having them send? And then also what are the most common mistakes that they're making in those exercises? Yeah. So, it, I mean, it depends on, on what, what, we have access to and what they're obviously like what their goals are. I'm not all of my clients are not using the hack squat. You know what I mean? But for someone who wants like, I want the, I want it all, you know, I want the physique sort of thing. If we have a hack squat, that's, that's decent, right? I, I'll be, 
honest, I'm not a fan of like the, the pre-core or a carry and hack squat that have the really big gap um, in between. Uh, so I, I will use that. If we have a pendulum, I'll, I'll use that. And, and I'll say the one of the most common mistakes is feet are too high, which provides a lot of hip flexion, but not a lot of like knee flexion in the extra depth right? Comes then from the hip flexion, the rounding of the lumbar spine and like the kind of butt lifting, but the knees are not, we're not getting, achieving that forward ankle of the tibia, you know, and the knee out over the, over the, the toes. So that's like a, a massively, massively common one that you'll see is like people will put their feet a little bit higher, a little bit wider because it's a lot more, you're a lot more, you, you can produce a lot more power from there because you're using a larger joint, you know, in a larger muscle group, but the hips, like your, your glutes in, in your hips and your adducts and everything are very, very strong in that position, but you're, you're, you're significantly reducing bias onto the quadriceps by using that, you know, more advantageous position to produce power and move a load, but you're, you're drastically reducing the stimulus going into the quads. And I would also add that by having your feet higher, it's going to be more comfortable. You're going to have less range of motion. So it's going to feel, and this is, this is easier. I can, I can handle more load. I don't have to travel as far. And even if I do bottom this out, I'm really not that deep into the squat. So it still feels okay. And so it's like yeah. just going towards what's the the most comfortable. Um, let's look at it from a lens of a, a back squat, for example. How are you setting up the client? Or maybe we look at it in a way of what are the mistakes that they're making in the squat that's not allowing for them to be more quad biased or foot positioning wise, you know, things that you take into consideration. Yeah, it, it, it's it's actually quite interesting. I uh, I won't use the like a barbell back squat with clients very often unless they have like very good squat mechanics, right? If I have an Asian client, yeah, we'll use the barbell <laughs> back squat. You know what I mean? Like because your squat mechanics are going to be textbook, right? Um, but well, it, it's another thing like knees are or like feet are really wide. It's a, it's you know what? I, I think it's something that's very it's very common that people get into like lifting from us from a sport background, you know, whether that's like basketball or whatever, or American football or something like that in so much of your like ready stance in sport is like, you know, feet a little bit wider than hips, like shoulder width. You can like pivot. Like that is like a very standard, like sport position. And then that carries over into like the gym because like, that's, that's my ready position, but it's, it couldn't be any further from the truth, especially if you, if you see people deadlifting too, and people put their feet like wider than their, and, and not a sumo. They're just like, this is their standard barbell, you know, conventional deadlift. Their feet are like wider than their hips and their hands are like super wide. And that's like where people set up and it's just different. We're not, you know, we're not, it's a different ready position that we need to learn. And you want your feet a little bit more narrow so that we can get the knees, you know, tracking right over, over, out over the, the outside of the foot, open up the hips a little bit and, and sit in between your, your knees and your feet. It's just different. So, so, I mean, that's one, if we are going to use it, depending on, I'll, I'll have them uh, send, send me something, you know, like, okay, what let's, you know, uh, uh, like your third warm up or something like that. Send me that video. Let's see what your, what your mechanics look like. And it's typically, okay, we want to move the feet in a little bit. Potentially we're going to elevate the heels and I'm going to use like a, a tempo with them for sure. Like a, a control decentric. I want to pause in the bottom and, and I want them to purposefully reduce load so that it, it's a, it's a smoother transition to this is the way I want you to perform your squats, you know, because if it's, Hey, I want sets of eight. And normally they would use 225 for sets of eight. Like they're going to gravitate towards 225. And let's, let's be real. If you're using 225 for a, a tempoed sets of eight with like a two second, you know, pause in the bottom with a heel elevation, like you're, you're pretty damn strong and your squat mechanics are, are pretty good, pretty damn good. Yeah. But many people can do that with like an extreme bastardization of the setup. Right. I, I think it is very eye opening for most people when they start to incorporate a heel elevation of how and, and really trying to buy a squat, staying upright within their upper body, how much less load they use, especially if they've been squatting for a while and they're more hip dominant within that positioning, which most people are going to be just naturally because of their limb links. Um, it's a very eye opening and humbling experience because most people need to drop load quite a bit. Oh, yeah. Now you, you brought up the, the heel elevation. Is there a degree of elevation that you most often recommend for clients? 
I mean, I I prefer the 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 less steep, the better. Uh, I, I obviously some people have very poor ankle dorsiflexion, and and for those people, uh, we may just not use a squat because even like I'm, and and it's not always the best to use myself as an example, but like my mechanics and stuff are pretty decent. And when I have a very steep angle, I just feel very unstable. And, and I feel like there, if we need to go to that level of, of incline, there's probably something else that we could use instead that would probably be like safer and feel more, feel less foreign. Cause when you get into a very steep heel elevation, like you do, it does feel foreign. Your, 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 your foot is in a very, you're, you're pressing off your, the ball of your toes uh, the ball of the balls of your feet more so because of the, the, the dip, the, the dip, the change in angle. And it just becomes, uh, I just don't love it personally. Uh, so I, I typically don't use it, but I would say like a 10 degree, maybe 15, but rarely would I, would I have someone set up with higher than that? I agree. The, I prefer the 10, the, the most going up to the 20 makes me feel like I'm on this like very steep hill. It feels very unbalanced for me. And it, it, it takes away from the load that you're able to lift. And then it's like, well, is it even worth the trade-off to have this extra 10 degrees of, of, um, heel elevation for me to maybe get more knee flexion, maybe, um, with a decent bit of less load potentially. I feel like it's the trade-off is not worth it there. And I would rather have less of a heel elevation and be able to handle more load with maybe even a little less knee flexion if that was the you know outcome. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Low reps is best. High reps is best. Fruit is so it's good. It's terrible. You, you should lift heavy. High reps. Carbs low are reps. needed. Keto Squats are bad for your Squats needs. are great. You for should your squat ass to grass. Toes. It's fine. It fits my macros. It's for idiots. When there are so many mixed messages going around, it's hard to know what you should even do or focus on. But that's exactly where physique development one on one coaching comes in. You might have heard of online coaching or even hired a coach before, but we believe in teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your life into consideration. We want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join Physique Development and let us be the last coach you ever need. So with with your clients and, and you have someone coming to you uh, who is wanting to grow their quads, is how do you go about allocating volume towards their quad training? And of course, that's going to come down to a number of different variables. And I want to be able to set the stage properly for you to answer it. Um, let's say this client has been training for four to five years. Over the last two years, they've really gotten a better grasp of how to execute movements well, um, but they're still just not seeing the results within growing their quads. Um, how do you go about structuring that client's programming? Yeah. So with with th this you know particular avatar of, of a client, I'm going to start us off with, with two sessions per week, typically. Uh, to, to quad focused sessions or, or leg sessions. And instead of really jumping into the volume side of things, I'm first going to assess really movement proficiency and performance and then intensity. Uh, that's something that I find as your training age progresses, um, there's kind of like this, this diverging path as people reach maybe four or five, like six years of training. There's the people who have figured it out. You know, those of us who are fortunate and like we've made it to the other side of the fence. And then the people who they have a good training age, but like they just don't have the results and, and stuff yet. And, and I really find that like training intensity, and this is just my opinion, you know, not everyone's going to agree with this, is that part where like people, some people figure out the, the, the necessary training intensity and then other people just kind of never, never do and just kind of or just tossing in their, you know, biases and in, in trying to play the volume game. But if more times than not, when someone's comes to me and they're like, Hey, you know, I, I like using that same example, I've been training, you know, four or five years, but things are just like not growing. And, and this is all the volume I'm doing. I'm like, okay, great. And, and this is the beauty of this day and age. Like send me your leg press, you know, send me your leg press, you know, first set or send me your hack squat set or whatever. We're, we're quite, we, we got a good RIR, you know, and, and I'm just in the camp of, and again, everyone's a little bit different here. 
if we're doing four or five sets and we're doing them to like four, five RIR, like let's take a couple of the, the two RIR, one RIR straight to the house and we can really reduce the amount of uh, overall volume and, and get in better work. And, and, and the re I mean, I'm guilty of this. Like I am even just, you know, maybe three years ago, I was someone who would think like, that's, that's it. You know, that's all I have. But one thing that I've figured out for myself um, personally, and that I, I use this a lot with clients for typically your bilateral squat pattern movements, when you're gauging RIR and stuff, fear will set in before failure. So if like, you're not scared yet, you're not, you're not yet at failure, you know, and it's not until you get very, very comfortable with achieving failure on hack squat, leg press, all of these things, will that fear kind of start to dissipate. If you're, if you're pretty new at it still yet, like you're going to get scared. You'll start getting scared at like a three RIR and you still have three good reps in. So like, if you're not afraid of the failure, like you're not even scratching the surface yet of failure, you still have like a solid four or five reps in you. And that's when I, I found is people are just afraid of failure. It, it kind of like what we talked about with the hack squat. It's a b- lot of weight on your back. You're in this like compromised position where you're, you know, your heels are at your butt and your knees are in your chest. And it's, it doesn't feel great. It feels very f- foreign and that sort of thing. And, and of course you're going to be afraid of not being able to stand up and getting pinned there. But, but that's where, you know, having spotters or training partners and those sorts of things and people, you know, I, I was going to say people you trust, but it could really be some random, you know, gym bro or gym girl that, that's just giving you a spot, um, d- just helping you work through those those fears. Yeah, that that was going to be my next question of how big of an importance do you feel having training partners is to being able to overcome that fear? Uh, unless you're, there, there are people who can do it without it, you know, but those are like your, your one-offs, your rare, those are like your psychopaths, really, <laughs> <laughs> you know, those are the people who, who can take the, the shotgun that is like, you know, modern day fitness in, in nutrition information and actually disseminate it down to them and, and get it right. And it happens rarely. Um, I have to, I have to give a shout out to one of my clients who we started together maybe like two months ago. And He's like, I think he's like 23 or 24, like pretty young. And we're doing the the consult. And he's like, Yeah, I just went through my first diet. You know, I'm like, I think I'm like 7% body fat. And I'm like, okay, dude. Like, you know, <laughs> you know, of every 20, you know, how many 23 year olds told me they were 7% body fat and they're like 13? And he sends me over his pictures and I almost like spit out my drink. And I was like, <laughs> oh my God, he was not lying. He was absolutely shredded. Wow. And he was just like, yeah, I just, you know, followed diet advice and did it, did it myself. It's my first time and everything. And I was like, oh my God, (laughs) that is crazy. (laughs) But that's like the one in 100 literally. Um, and, and I think like the training partners is massive because most people are not going to be that literally 99% of people will not be that 1% who's going to take their hack squats, you know, ass to grass right up to failure and that sort of thing. And the training partners, because it, it, it's, 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 you, you can get good at gauging your RIRs, but again, it's not like a bicep curl where you're like, yeah, I, th- I think then I think this, this next one is it. Like you're not afraid and being crushed with a bicep curl, like in a back squat and a hack squat or anything that's, that's really taking the quad through, through, through a lengthened position under load. Like you have you, your, your heart rates elevated. You have, uh, um, um, oftentimes, actually loading, you know, through the spine and you're bracing through the core, like you're working so much more and there's so much more going on in your head. And it's not just like a, ah, maybe this is, you know, maybe the next rep's failure. It's like, no, I got to set my core. I got to brace. I have to make sure I can breathe. I have to try and, you know, recover my oxygen debt because I'm 12 reps in and my heart rate's like skyrocketed. There's so many things going on. And when you're doing that by yourself, like it's, it's a lot to compartmentalize. And if you don't have a lot of experience doing it, like, of course you're going to just rack it at three RIR. But when you have that training partner in, it's so much easier to gauge RIR when you're not the person lifting and they can say like, no, like keep going, like, no, keep going. Cause if the, if the, if the, if the weight's just moving, you know, and your rep speed is like barely slowing down every second split second, when you're in the machine feels like it's like time is slowing down. You know, you'll, you'll watch it and like, man, that last rep was like eight seconds long and you watch it back and it's like a second and a half, you know, (laughs) you have such a distorted perception. 
So when you have that training partner, like they can objectively pull you through the set and be like, no, this is, you know, RIR zero or RIR one or something like that. And it's all you have to do is perform. You, you can take your mind out of it when you have those training partners. Absolutely. I, I think that having a good training partner is the number one way, honestly, to put on the most muscle tissue. Just being able to have someone that you're in there consistently with in battle, every every training session, just getting after it and pushing one another. There's honestly nothing that beats it. And that's one thing that I miss about you know training here at the house 99% of the time by myself. Uh, now, with the client who is not able to have a training partner. Maybe they're in, in my position, they're training at home, they have a good home gym, but they're still just training by themselves. Do you have any tools that you implement for them to be able to push to that level of, of failure or have a better understanding of training close to failure? Yeah. I mean, we'll put in, we'll save ourselves from ourselves. You know, it's like, well, let's use the safety stops and those sorts of things, or we'll use a little bit more reservation. You know, if, if we have like Let's just keep using the hack squat example. Like it, you typically can't really if if you're performing it in the manner that you and I are describing. You know, ass to grass, suit, lots of knee flexion. The safety stops are pretty much at the very bottom, so like you're going to get pinned pretty much regardless, sort of thing. We'll train a little bit further, and then we might you know do like a um, some sort of intensity technique where it's like okay, after the last you know set, we're going to pull a plate off and do an, another couple reps to like a one RIR, pull the next plate off. So we'll do like some some set, some things that like intensify or, or elongate the set because we can't train as close in, in proximity to failure because of safety reasons. So there's other ways that we'll, we'll incorporate, you know, more reps in a very close proximity to failure in a, in a more safe manner. Awesome. Yeah. The, you brought up intensifiers a little bit. How are you a fan of supersets, drop sets, <clears throat> other modalities like that for quad training, you know, obviously it's going to be different at different points in training phase or what have you, but how do you use those tools potentially, uh, within quad training? Yeah. So it's obviously the dependent upon the client and I, I really leverage like the client's ambition, right? If someone's like, Hey, you know, I just want to lose some body fat and, and build some muscle sort of thing. Like I'm not punishing those clients with intensity modification, <laughs> modify intensity techniques and those sorts of things. But for the people like, like you and I, who are just, just into it, into the culture, that's that sort of thing. A little sick in the head. Yeah, I will. And I, I on lengthened, uh, bias things, not so many drop sets because typically you find that you have to pull a lot of weight, you know, um, or else you're going to get one rep and, and fail again, sort of thing. But like like a leg extension is perfect for for drop sets because it's a short short bias movement. Uh, I'm a very very big fan of like rest paw sets, um, and, and that would probably be the, the most common uh, or like a myo rep match. I really really like using it as well with um, hack squat or, or a lengthened bilateral squat pattern movement, and that's kind of performance dependent, which I like too. Is it's not like you know, do, do five and then five, then five. It's like, Hey, it's, it's dependent upon your performance, how brutal or, or kind of easy that that becomes. Okay. And so you brought up the, the leg extension. And I think that this is one, I mean, this is one exercise, really the only exercise that we have where we can fully shorten the, the rec fem and train the rec fem through a, a greater overall range of motion. We have, you know, some things that are going to be better within lengthening. Um, uh, but within the, the leg extension, how do you like to use this within the program design for maybe yourself and then also for your clients? Do you like this to start off a quad session? Do you like this to be towards the end of a, a quad session? Yeah. So, and I guess a lot of my clientele is as I age, right? My clientele is, I mean, a lot of my clientele is older than me, actually. They must think I'm very mature, which is like some, some lie that I've just somehow got them to believe. <laughs> um, and, and as much as I, I hate to admit it, like joint integrity it is a thing. And I typically now will put all of like personally, all of my short, uh, overloads stuff before, like even so much so that in like now personally, when I'm training, like my first three exercises are typically like a leg extension, uh, that the adductor machine and like a, a seated or a lying leg curl. Like I hit all of my short stuff first, 
everything, my, my joints are, are warm, lubricated, ready to move. And then I've, I've found that it's just my compounds just feel so much better and they just don't feel like they beat me up. And, and really it's because I'm just much more primed to perform them. Um, and then sometimes, you know, I don't have to use as much load because some things are, are in some state of, of, of a pre-fatigue. Do you, that was going to be the, the next thing that I asked was that, do you feel like you have a drop off in your lengthened exercises when you have the shortened work beforehand? It, it's sometimes never to the degree that I would expect. So it, it might be, you know, like, let's say f- I had the, the pendulum squat. And if the pendulum squat goes in like the first, you know, uh, quad movement, I might get like eight for my top set. I'll typically only drop a rep, maybe worse. I'll drop two reps to like a six. Um, and, and that's typically what I've found. Okay. The, it, it's interesting because when I am, am thinking about this, I really like starting any squat based training sessions or, or more quad focused work with lying leg curls. I find it to be what just gets me in the best position possible to have the best squat. And so there may be a drop off in, in weight, but I do feel like the mechanics or the movement pattern itself is so much more smooth. And I feel like I get more out of it, even if it is, let's say a five to 10% drop off in load. If I didn't do the leg curl, I find that it's still a better overall training session or you know, however many sets I'm performing uh, when doing that. So I, I can agree with that as well. Yeah. That one, it, it's, it's really hard because it's like, we know performance is a, a big driver of, of hypertrophy. And then when we're in, let's say a dieting phase, muscle retention and those sorts of things, but it's for, especially if we're talking, you know, naturals and, and people who've been at this game for a while, like the, the amount of progress you can make, like even when things are going really well, it's not astronomical in a, let's even say like a two month period or something like that. So I, I, it's hard because at the same time, I'm very much like, we need all those one percenters we can get at this point in the game. But I'm also like not convinced that by performing like the leg press, you know, after everything else that it's going to be like, you have, you know, tangible X less hypertrophy because of that. So I I do find myself kind of on both sides of the fence um, ultimately, I, I, if I had to pick an answer, I'd say it probably doesn't matter. It'd probably be like indetectable in, you know, a uh, cross-sectional area or anything like that. If, if we were to put it, you know, to under, under a mi- microscope sort of thing, but, but I could see how people could have a, f- a firm stance on, on either side. Right. And you speak a, a little bit to it in part to the, uh, the research side of things of like, you know, can we, can we really see the difference to this when you're going through client programming, how percentage base, how much do you take into, into, into consideration the research relative to your anecdotal experience with, with your clients, with yourself? What, how does that break down for you, uh, during your own program design? Yeah, I, I would say, and I, I love this question. I personally feel this is my personal feeling. I, I could be wrong here. As you, as your physique progresses more, right? As you move closer towards your genetic potential, I personally feel that the research is less applicable because the populations that the research has been done on are not overly representative of that new person, right? So, with that, I think it depends on the uh, the the training age and, and prog- progression of a, of that client. If we have a a novice or an intermediate, almost everything we should do be doing should be pretty much by the book of what the research suggests. You know, probably not a lot of intensity techniques, getting a lot of the foundations and, and movement patterns and these sorts of things down. Not a lot of your targeted, you know, lumbar lat specific things. If this person has only, it just, you know, is in their first year of training, like we need general load and in, in, in volume at equal distributions across the body, learning how to perform movements, you know, proficiently, that sort of thing. But as you get that, that client who's been training 10 years and has a really good, you know, physique and those sorts of things, I think that's where we bring in more, uh, you know, not as straightforward or not as easily studied uh, or replicated and studied things because uh, of this person has already made it through those, you know, proverbial ranks um, with their physique. I can agree with that. I I believe that with 
the research, it's just, you, you, there's a point where it's very difficult to even get data collected on these different things, like to understand being able to get a sample size that's big enough to where those individuals are doing X thing that you're able to track over in an extended period of time. And those people are in the same training age and, and understanding of training and then being able to apply whatever the thing is. I mean, that is a, the likelihood of that is so slim. And so once you get into the research and really understand what you're reading and those different factors, you realize that it's only applicable, like you said, to a, a small percentage of people. And at like this is always going to to be the case is that the anecdote is always going to be in front of the research because the only way that the research happens is because of the anecdote and then we are like okay this is kind of working let's put funding into this particular thing to see what the validity of this is and so that's just going to be the reality of the the beast if you will and understanding that i think is tremendously important because when i first started coaching i was like this is exactly text book. This is what I'm reading in the study. We should do this exactly. And then when it didn't work, it was like, I mean, what's going on? Like who is broken here? Is it me as the coach or is it the, the client themselves? And it would be so frustrating because I just wanted, you know, concrete answers. I thought that that was like a reality of the situation. And the true reality is that it really does come down to the person and being able to have a strong understanding of, of everything and then being able to, um, take the data, apply, and then, you know, uh, rinse and repeat and make adjustments accordingly to see what is actually successful for the client themselves. Yeah. And, and the, the hard thing with research is it, you have to learn so much about it before you can really like confidently use it at, at, at a deeper level. And, and the biggest thing I wanted to get out of that is like the, the research reports, population means and averages, like that's where they generate their, you know, their suggestions from. But if you actually like dig into the the actual individual responses and stuff, like there's going to be these massive outliers, you know, someone's going to grow insanely well on a certain level of volume and someone else was, was grew, grew like very, very poorly on that same response, you know, to, to probably to an effect of like double or, or half, I should say, using that example. So you very well may be an anomaly of, of these certain things. And there's the, the thing that always kind of, uh, grinds my gears a little bit with, with some of the research on, on, uh, strength training and resistance training. And, and this is because, you know, uh, first and foremost, I'm a nutrition guy, like, uh, nutrition is my bread and butter. That's, that's, you know, how I, that's my favorite. Let's put it that way. Nothing's talked about with nutrition or any of the other things that we know, you know, massively impact recovery, performance, hypertrophy, rates of hypertrophy, and all these things is, and, and uh, well, again, I, I could only imagine how insanely difficult that is to one, you know, a, a fund and, a, and pay for it to have people adhere. These, these study participants aren't getting paid, right? They're like undergrad students and exercise phys undergrad students and stuff, right? But I know that like when I have a client who has a, a, um, a significant, significantly higher interest in the outcome of this, they're emotionally invested. It's not just credits for a course. And I know I can, I can personally put my hands in the manipulation of all these other variables. Like I feel much more confident in my skills and what I know within this one specific context with this client, because I can, uh, I can micromanage so many of the, of the other variables that we know are, are massively relevant in hypertrophy and, and fat loss and all these, these, you know, uh, physique physique outcomes. Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing, turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty? I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one -on -one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. 
You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program because you are awesome and I want you to have this program. I'm going to give you $25 off making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. That leads me to to my next question of when we look at research and we can we can be specific to quads, but we can also expand it to greater overall hypertrophy. If there was, let's say, one thing that you are excited about or looking forward to them furthering research understanding on, um, what would that be? Like a, a topic or a specific type of training, whatever the case may be. That's a really good question. Um, oh, I, okay. So this is, it took me a little bit to think about, cause this is a really, really good one. Mine would be overfeeding carbohydrate versus fat overfeeding studies in resistance trained populations, right? Because, uh, the last time I, I, I did a deep dive on this was probably 2021. So about two years ago, and uh, I could find about maybe like 12 overfeeding studies that I found on, um, uh, so they, they took, you know, participants, put them in, in a hypercaloric state and they were like, okay, we're going to put you in a, whatever, 10% surplus from predominant, predominantly like you're in the, the predominantly fats group. Now we're in the predominant, you know, carbohydrate group. And we're going to see, you know, how, what, what's the distribution of lean mass versus fat mass as we go through this hypercaloric state. I, uh, like I said, I think I could find like 13 studies. I think only one or two of them actually have resistance trained populations. Everyone else is like middle-aged overweight, you know, standard American sort of thing. So this is one where I would love more information because I, I see when people are providing information, they'll say like, oh, well, if you're, if you're in a gain and you want to build muscle, like fats or carbs, it doesn't matter. Just, just get the calories in. That's all that matters. Where I like thrive in, in the context and the nuance. And I'm like, it does matter. <laughs> <laughs> it does matter because if we put you in a hypercaloric, you know, state, if you are resistance trained, if you are insulin sensitive, if you are metabolically healthy, we push the carbohydrate, right? Because we get better performance, we get better recovery, we can train harder for longer and more frequent because we can recover better and we will get less fat than if we just ate the fats, right? That that is my stance, right? I, I do I do believe that. Something could come out in the future that I am wrong. I will eat those words. I'm wrong from time to time, but I would love that because that's like an area where I feel like is a bit of a low hanging fruit where people are still, I don't want to call them like misinformed, but, but less informed than they could otherwise be with some more additional context and nuance. So do you feel that your training performance when higher carb per se is significantly better, whether it be in a dieting phase or it be in a surplus? More so in the dieting phase because things things matter more in a surplus because you're operating at, at an effective loss. You know, with if your surplus is big enough, your training performance should be pretty good. Um but, but I do, if I had to pick a side of the fence to stand on, yes, I would stand on that side that, you know, that a higher carbohydrate intake would, would be better for performance hypertrophy whilst mitigating body fat accumulation, right? If, if you don't care about how fat you're going to get and you're just after the gains and yeah, do whatever you want. But if you, if you do want to kind of try and shift your partitioning ratio or just, or even just mitigate the amount of fat accumulation. I, I do believe that a higher carbohydrate approach would be advantageous for that. I'm on board with that. I mean, I know for myself, I prefer a lower fat, higher carb, whether it be in a fat loss phase or it be in a surplus, that is how I prefer to eat. I also feel my best tremendously, especially within my training when, when that's the case, I've, I've tried higher fat approaches, uh, with my train or, you know, in either phase and I have not felt the same or felt as good. Um, so I'm in, I'm in the same camp. Um, I'd like to, to finish today's episode with, uh, I know you are building an amazing gym in, in Bali, and I would love to hear about the quad equipment that you have decided to be worth it the best for your new gym space? Yeah, this one has been, 
It's been very, I'm so, so excited about it. It's probably the most excited thing I am for. There is so many challenges that that I think I was not prepared for as I uh, agreed to join the, the gym. So a little bit of backstory. Uh, it, it, I have to say Jackson Pias is building a gym. It's called Undefeated. He asked me to be a part of it. Um, so I'm like the first partner in it, but it's effectively Jackson's gym. Um, so we are in Bali, Indonesia, right? So we're over in Asia on the other side of the world. There is some kind of gym startup uh, equipment manufacturers. Like obviously you have like some of your China-based manufacturers and those sorts of things, but pretty much everything is on the other side of the world, right? And then getting things shipped over here is super expensive and in these massive long timelines and then lead times for companies like it's been complicated. I, I think I was a little bit naive until the, to the complications <laughs> of it, but, uh, what I've been trying to do. So what we have ordered so far, we have a pendulum squat. We have a hack squat. We have a one leg extension. We have a prone lying leg curl. We have three calves seated standing the angle press. We have the Nautilus uh, leverage leg press, hip mm -hmm. press, leg press guy. That's, that's a little bit older. Um, I'm probably missing something. We have a, a gluteator. Those okay. are pretty rare. You don't see a lot of those. No. We have a gluteator, um, a uh, a kneeling glute, not really a kickback, but like a, it's the Jim Lecca one. It's it, it kind of like, it's like an arcing kind of unilateral like glute m movement. Yeah. So <sighs> there's a, a good amount, but I'm still on the lookout for a proper seated ham. The, 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 the two uh, manufacturers that we, that we ordered from, uh, didn't produce a, uh, pr pretty much. I don't like Jim Lecco's seated ham curl just, and I'm like, I'm not buying that cause I don't like it. So didn't like that one. Uh, still on the lookout for one of those linear leg press. We still need a squat press, a Cybex squat press. I will find one in Asia and we will get it in here. <laughs> and that, that one will happen for sure. Uh, and I want a second like extension. I really want to find one of the strive plate loaded ones, okay. the OG strive plate loaded ones. I assume yeah. getting it's been challenging. like prime in Atlantis is impossible. Well, the hard thing with prime is you got a 13 month lead time. Well, I'll tell you this is that I have stuff that we just ordered for here and it's 11 mm -hmm. month and they're literally yeah. four hours away. So it's like, they're just way backed up in general. Yeah. And in, I, I mean, I love the prime stuff and that's what, that's why I want to just find strive used strive stuff, secondhand strive stuff. And, um, I, I kind of have a plan that once we have our like 85% of equipment, you know, up, um, I may come back to the States to go to one of the really big, like used secondhand ones, like the super fitness, uh, gym equipment down in like North Carolina, and then just go through and like hand pick out like the 10 re remaining machines. The, the hard thing there is because we're in Indonesia and it's like a, you know, a, this there's import duties uh, and stuff. So okay. it's like you, it, you're paying a lot to import the equipment. So, and there's, there's like a game to like, okay, well, if we get these pieces here and we can like max fill the container, we can save some money on import costs. Cause it like, you're paying like X money per container you import. So it's, it's, it's a new thing, you know, just a new entrepreneurial pursuit and just learning as we go and trying to, to get it perfect on the first attempt because it's very costly, it, you know, <laughs> if I do not. Um, but it, it, I'm fortunate that it's, I'm sure as the listeners can, can tell, it's something I'm super passionate about. So like if this was, I don't know, if we were importing like chairs to make money, I would, I would fucking hate my life. And I'd be, I would have quit a long time ago, you know, but because it's something that I like, I, I feel passionate about and I'm, and I'm very, very confident that we will have the best gym in Bali, the best gym in Indonesia, that uh, it's so worth this effort because I, I feel fortunate, right? As the American here in it's something that you kind of take for granted when you you have, especially on, on like parts of the East Coast, there's these amazing gyms that have, you know, body masters and old school strive and the Nautilus and all this, this amazing equipment from like the early 2000s and late 90s that the, um, the Nebula uh, stuff like 
the rest of so many parts of the world never saw it, you know, and, and they're using just like whatever eighth gen pre-core has turned into, which like sold out and is all crappy bullshit and stuff. Like <laughs> I'm like, no, I want, the, I want this stuff, you know, from 20 years ago. That's like the, the best leg press ever made was literally made 25 years ago. And I want to get these things. So that's kind of like where I get excited of was like, people just don't know. And, and I'm just, fortunate one i'm 36 so i've been around long enough to experience you know some of these things and then um you know being from the states where a lot of this equipment was made and stuff like no we want these are the things we want to get and we'll have a spot that like no one else has and it will be the best so that's awesome that's a, a big project we should open about the end of the year so we still have i don't know nine nine ten months uh, building is under construction right now so exciting Nice. So what's the, do you have like a top three wish list? You kind of talked about it a little bit, but I was curious if you had like a, a top three, that's like, I need to have these before we open. Yeah. Squat press one Cybex squat press for sure. I do want the strive plate loaded leg extension. I do really want that. Um, I think that's, those are the, the only two. I mean, a lot of my top ones we already got. Um, so I, I am pretty pumped about that. Uh, oh, and I'll say one that I've been on, on the hunt for. This isn't really, this is, this is like Jackson's top one, a seated tricep, like, uh, overhead machine, you know, oh, okay. like a seated, like, uh, uh, front French press sort of thing. A lot of them have the like bar that comes in from the side and I've just used enough where it's like, it just doesn't feel good. I want like a, a belt or cable driven one where you can like step on the platform or step on the, the lever that like props the handle up so you can get your hands in place because it's like a, a tr for a tricep thing it's something you can load up pretty well and you're i mean we're pretty strong in that position and a lot of them that don't have that that foot lever like you have to like super arch your back to try and get into position and then it's they're just to be able to effectively load it with the triceps in that in that very length and position where you're strong it, it, you need a spotter to someone to like help get get you get get it to you so that's like the third one um I think body masters makes okay. a, a pretty good one. I've seen a few like Jim 80 makes a really good one. Jim 80 is a big, big gym manufacturer out of, out of Germany. That was another big thing for me. I know like these States, you know, equipment manufacturers, but there's a whole world out there. There's like pretty cool stuff coming out of Australia. Jim 80s out of Germany, um, predators out of Croatia. Like it was just, I had to do a lot more looking instead of just being like, Oh, well, I know prime and in, in these things, let's get that to be like, well, what else is out there in the world? And, and there's a lot of cool companies all over the world making really good equipment. Huh. I'll have to, I'll have to pick your brain more about that in, in the future. Uh, I appreciate you coming on. It was great to have a chat with you and, and learn more about uh, how you got, have gone about your quad training. Is there anything that you want to leave the listeners with, whether that be um, something for their quad training that you, you want to really drive home or anything that you have going on for yourself and, and your coaching service, anything at all? I would say find a way to, to get, achieve maximal knee flexion. And that typically means getting your ankle or getting your knees out over your toes by like elevating your heel or something like that. So I, I think for a lot of people, it's a, it's a pretty ludicrous spend, but Olympic weightlifting shoes are, are going to be wonderful. And then just accepting that you're going to have to reduce the load, but maximize your range of motion and, and you will get much better results by, you know, f f uh, going after this path. Awesome. Appreciate you guys. Or appreciate you guys listening. Make sure that you subscribe to the channel, like this video, and we'll see you in the next episode.